It is a thrill and a delight to be back on the campus and to look out over this vast audience. I bring you the love and the greetings from President Ezra Taft Benson. I was with him a few days ago at his, at his home. He is living with his daughter in Salt Lake for a brief period following his recent illness. But we had a delightful visit, uh, the two of us, and I, but I bring you his love and greetings and the concern that he has, of course, for all of you and the love that he shares and sends to you. This joyous season that brings us Thanksgiving and Christmas is the best time of the year. It's when we think of families, loved ones everywhere, and things of the heart. I have prayed for divine guidance that these few precious moments might be beneficial to all. I am mindful of my responsibility as well as my desire to encourage you in your personal lives to follow the course of our Savior unto salvation. It is not possible to explore or examine the vast realm of revealed gospel knowledge about our mortal existence available to you at this un unusual university. And so on this day, I bring you not an argument nor or a doubt, but a witness of heaven-sent revelations that this is the Church of Jesus Christ restored to the earth in these latter days, that God, our Heavenly Father, lives and that He loves each of us who are His children, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, our Savior. The heavenly event related by young Joseph, then only four or five years younger than most of you, after he came out of the grove of trees, which we appropriately referred to as the sacred grove, are true. I bear this witness and testimony to you. Joseph Smith was directed after scripture study and prayer to pray for guidance, and he did see and communicate with God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. This church is led today by his prophet, upon whom the Almighty has bestowed the greatest gifts that mortal man is capable of receiving, even our prophet Ezra Taft Benson. I am a witness to the bestowal of the, the authority and the gifts upon President Benson. A few days ago, a most unusual news article about the Mormons appeared in the Sunday magazine section of the Los Angeles or of the London Times. One of the most influential newspapers in the world. I'm holding a copy up here for you to see. And one and one with the widest one of the widest circulations in the world. One million three three hundred thousand copies. Ten times the circulation of Utah's largest newspaper. As I studied this rather remarkable article, because it is so favorable and positive about us, I reflected upon the promise and direction our Lord gave 26-year-old Joseph Smith at the Johnson Farmhouse in November 1831. The instructions to translate the Book of Mormon and the promise that he would be given the power to, the, to lay the foundations of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. In my lifetime, I have been permitted to witness events, to see and feel divine influences of the Lord in His providence, revealing His gospel by the power of the Holy Ghost. Imagine from the humble but heavenly directed events of the restoration of the gospel to this publication in the London Times. And we had nothing directly to do with the article. 
But the press and the British Broadcasting Corporation were conscious and involved this past summer of our 150th anniversary celebration of our first missionaries arriving in Great Britain. The interest developed by writers for the London Times resulted in this most complimentary article about our growth and message, and it was written by a non-member. Well, we all know that unusual things are happening all over the world to bring about the unrolling of the message of the Restoration to every nation and every people of the divine sonship of our Lord Jesus, and that salvation is in Christ, that faith also might increase in the earth, that mine everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. You who attend this university have such unusual opportunities and blessings available to you. Every facet of your lives should be enriched by what you do, how you govern your lives, and what you learn while you are here. I urge you to take full advantage of every uplifting aspect of university life, spiritually, academically, socially, and physically, but to feed your souls as well as your mind. Someone has likened each of our lives to a mighty river as it flows into the sea. It is the product of many streams, some large, some small. Even little brooks created by the melting snow high in the mountains. I thank God for the streams, clear and pure, that have influenced my life. For noble parents who taught me the goodness of life, to honor, of honor and virtue, and who taught me to love the Lord. For my widowed mother who, like the prophet Joseph, taught me correct principles with understanding and with motherly patience. For the priesthood and even the activities of, of the early scouting program and for the desire that I had to go on to college and for the blessings of finding my sweetheart who is here with me today. I knew when I first saw her that she would be my eternal companion if I could only convince her to feel the same way that I did but for the blessings of our three children that have blessed our lives and to have our daughter Karen here today with her husband John and with the, the posterity we have in our family and with three of our grandchildren here today whom President Holland has already acknowledged. But my gratitude for the many streams and rivers that have affected my life, I'm so grateful. Each stream has a beginning, a source from which it springs. Yours has emerged and developed from the sources of parents, home, family training, early schooling, and the many, many people who have touched your lives. Soon you will be moving out into the world on your own with the necessity and the hoped-for ability to make your own way. You are at junctions in your lives or nearing them, where your stream may take you on to great heights or not so high to joy and happiness or some regrets and even some disappointments. But I urge you to wisely use your time and to stretch your intellect and to expand your horizons that you may be prepared to fulfill your personal role in the restored church and kingdom and to be all that you can be, using correct principles to contain the waters within the banks of your own personal stream as it flows on in a true course towards the high reward of eternal life. You might say at this point, oh, we hear that from your brethren all the time. So maybe you do. But we who love you will continue to encourage each of you to determine where you are on the ladder as you climb step by step 
upwards through this testing period that we're in because we too have been there. The Savior taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I received a letter this past week from a young father who, with his wife and two children, joined the church four months ago. He had attended a regional conference of H8 stakes, which we had held in Arizona last month, and he wrote, I learned at the conference of love of God and of my fellow men. I learned that spiritual acts and a help thy neighbor attitude will be more valuable than all the riches of the world. I learned not to just strive for higher income, but to work to earn enough money for our needs. And some of the time and effort that I would normally spend in attempting to make just more money will go to reading the scriptures and teaching my family the gospel at family home evenings. I realized what I received through baptism might be wasted by not making the proper decisions and afford the and afford to uh, uh, and, and the effort to earn the blessings of the celestial kingdom. I was impressed by this new member and his family that only after four months of participation, their precious faith was already increasing that they might receive the precious promises that have been promised to us and as declared by the Apostle Peter. Several years ago, I sat in a little white room in the Los Angeles temple, a simple little room with no fancy adornments on the wall. My wife, Ruby, was there by my side. We had one son and his wife there, along with our daughter, Karen, who was here, and her new husband, John, who was here. But our other son was kneeling at the altar, holding the hand of a young lady he was about to be sealed to. And as I looked around the room, I knew that the great moment of my life was there, then, because all that I had that was really important, remember, really important with eternal values, was in that room. Their bishops and stake presidents had found each of my family worthy to be in that room. It is not the number of cars that you might home, own or the size of your bank account or the number of cattle that you might have in the hills, but the eternal values that really count. You remember the Lord said something about moth and rust get through to our worldly possessions, but I knew that the greatest moment of my life was having all of my, our family in that little white ceiling room in the Los Angeles temple, that they were there. Each of our children and their companions had participated in the sacred ordinances and cer ceremonies which pertain to salvation and exaltation in the kingdom of God. One of the greatest blessings of life is to, realize, is to realize what is truly important in our lives, then work towards that end. Our Lord and Savior's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that last evening, for the souls of all of mankind, taking their sins and sufferings upon himself, clearly shows the need for us to know, to respect, to love and to be obedient to our eternal Father. When the, the Savior so explained when he emphasized in that prayer, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only God, true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Some years ago, Cecil B. DeMille produced the epic film, The, the Ten Commandments, and he gave an address in which he discussed the pressing need for making the film at that time. And I would remind you that many today in this so-called modern and materialistic society think these commandments a bit archaic. But our, but our Lord God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai the great governing principles 
we are all subject to and by which men will be judged. Moses received these commandments twice, and on each occasion written by the finger of the Lord on tablets of stone. The first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. We do not bow before giant birds or carved granite or wooden idols with stone eyes, but we have other gods competing with gods. We may never have bowed before a calf of gold, but we may still worship gold. Is there a man or a woman who can honestly say that he has never put his ambitions or his vanity above God, or worshiped flesh more than God, or worshiped the blue-white glisten of a fine diamond, or the earthly beat of rock and roll, or even worship himself above the worship of God? This can enslave us and betray us into modern idolatry. The Lord also said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. When I was a boy, I thought that referred only to profanity. But far worse than profanity is the use of the name of God for personal worldly gain, for ambition, for intolerance, for selfish power over other men, or as a righteous cloak for unrighteous deeds. We take the name of God in vain whenever we misuse the power of God or whenever we say to him, not thy will, but mine be done. President Kimball told the story after one of his operations of being wheeled in the hospital cart down the corridor of the hospital and onto the elevator. But the elevator floor was not equal to the floor of the hospital. And as the orderly pushed the pushed the uh, cart containing the president, uh, uh, Kimball, onto the elevator, it made a bump. And President Kimball heard the orderly take the name of the Lord in vain. That great man, just coming out of the anesthetic and heard what happened, said to the orderly, Oh, don't say that. He is my best friend the man who had taken the name of the Lord in vain apologized and said he would never do it again. The commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, fares none too well in the headlong rush of modern living. Mankind has coined countless slogans about the value of time. But this commandment re reminds us that time belongs to God and that some of it must be set aside for him. The vital and essential part of this commandment is that we cannot remain close to God unless we set aside periods of time as God's time, periods of rest from the affairs of the world. The soul seeks true communion with the spirit of truth in, in meditation, in prayer. Students should organize their time so that most studying can be done on weekdays leaving the Sabbath for worshipful activities. The Lord said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so it is with all of the commandments. Each of God's laws are essential. But particularly today in our somewhat confused society, the Lord commanded also, but with emphasis, neither shalt thou commit adultery and then added in modern revelation, nor anything like unto it. The commandments are basic to the gospel and the plan of salvation and are, are as true and valid and real as the day that they were cut into the tablets of stone by the finger of God. Our living the laws of the, of the Ten Commandments is only the beginning or the foothills in our climb towards perfection. The Savior told the rich young man who was keeping the basic commandments to sell all of his possessions and follow the master, suggesting he should move up to a higher plane in his quest for eternal life. Joseph Smith declared, I teach men correct principles so that they may govern themselves. You students have been taught, hopefully in your homes or through religious associations, correct 
principles. You also have the unique, unique opportunity to be taught correct principles while here at this university. I hope you learn your lessons well, that your streams may become mighty rivers of pure, clear water as they flow into the sea. A willingness to serve in the kingdom and, and do whatever you're called upon to do demonstrates a life of faith and goodness. And it is one of those streams in our lives that can so bless not only others, but, our, but ourselves as well. I was impressed with the remarks of a stake president who was released recently, and at, at the conference he made these remarks. He said, my service has been out for all to see, but think of the many auxiliary and other leaders and individual members of the church who have at the same time quietly done their duty and been faithful to the Lord. Some of the greatest service rendered while I have been your president, he continued, has been done silently out of great sacrifice by individual members. Theirs is the widow's might. Theirs is the blessing of true service. And the president continued remembering his ancestry and his parents and his children and his business partner, partner and his professional secretaries, members of his high council and state clerks and secretaries. And then he stated, I would not have been able to serve a single week without the help, love, and support of my dear wife. And in tribute to the bishops and branch presidents and other leaders, he said, they serve where the tire hits the road. They have been faithful and loyal to me as well as to the Lord. And particularly those he declared, and particularly to his counselor who declared to him, you may not wear the hair shirt, meaning that he was never to feel guilty. He had been called to the Lord and he was not to feel guilty over difficult decisions which he had to make. He told of looking in the mirror and saw in his mind's eye the hands of God kneading the bread dough of his kingdom and folding him, the stake president, back into the general loaf of the kingdom of God. Mine, he said, was a time to rise for a moment but now I would become a part of the general membership again as a brother in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so other lives will now be blessed and raised for the good of the loaf of God. What a wonderful attitude, a stake president demonstrating and teaching how we believe and pray and, st and study the scriptures, earn our livelihood, and still serve our God with love. His stream was right on course, I thought. The Lord wants and needs all of you to be strong, to be believers, to be examples of goodness to all of the world. You can become mighty rivers flowing with truth. Mediocrity and weaklings come with little effort. The world has an abundance of them. I would urge you to use your time wisely. Don't waste it on frivolous pursuits. Ted Koppel, the national newscaster, told the graduates of Duke University this spring, we can take television's daily banquet without drawing on any intellectual resources, without either physical or moral discipline. He continued, in the place of truth, we have discovered facts. For moral obs uh, absolutes, we have substituted moral ambiguity. We now communicate with everyone and say absolutely nothing." End of quote. To you, I admonish you to live so that you can ask for the personal revelation that you are entitled to. Someone has written, Souls are not saved in bundles, they are saved individually. <clears throat> and the Spirit saith, how, how is it with thee, with thee personally? How are things with you, each of you personally? How are you doing? 
To help you evaluate, I'm going to just pose a few questions with an answer from the, from the scriptures who bear the record of truth. I pose the question to you, who are you? You are the literal spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents. In Genesis, we read, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female. And then Paul added in Romans, the spirit itself heareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I would say to you, where did you come from? Your spirit <clears throat> body came from your heavenly parents. Your spirit lived in the highest degree of glory in the celestial kingdom, which is exalted glory likened to the sun in comparison to the moon and the stars. And then Ecclesiastes, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Why are you here? You are here because you kept your first estate. You are here to be proved and to be tested, to prove that you can make right choices and to be faithful in them. From the writings of Abraham, we read, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon, and they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those of, who, of the first. And then in the Doctrine and Covenants, we add to that, And I give unto you a commandment, that ye shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. For I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide by my covenant even unto death, that you may be found worthy. You are here to develop the gifts and the talents to which you were born heir. You will have the opportunity. You've, you've been given talents, and you will have the opportunity to gain, and gain additional talents with those talents that you've already been born with. You are here to sow good works and to lay up treasures in heaven. In the Doctrine and Covenants, seek not for riches but for wisdom, and behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. You are here to meet the requirements and complete the ordinance, ordinances to become an heir to the celestial glory. You are here to become an heir of celestial glory, there, and there, there are requirements that must be met. You are to be sealed to a companion for time and all eternity. You are to work out your exaltation and be of assistance to others. You are here to learn to use the body, your body to accomplish spiritual objectives and to obey the law of procreation. You are to strive for perfection and to receive the fullest of joy. With your understanding of truth, you have power to do many things of your own free will and choice and to glorify his holy name. You have the power of prayer. You have the power over Satan. You have the power of forgiveness. You have the power of the Holy Ghost. It is within your power to discipline all your appetites and inclinations and you have the power to choose your destiny to inherit the celestial or the telestial or the telestial kingdom. Now I leave you my love and my blessings and pray that God will bless each of you, that you will rise to the heights that can be yours, that you will magnify the opportunities that come in, have come into your life. And may the streams of your life lead you towards the ultimate goal of life everlasting in the celestial kingdom of God, our Heavenly Father. We love you, leave you our blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.